my kids never asked me much about the Air Force until just recently, and my oldest son has been at me too. Yeah, I've heard that from, from many kids. But and I sent a bunch of stuff out to him, and I recorded something on some small tapes that he sent down and sent it to him, and he was going to put it all together, and I don't know if he's got it done yet or not. Anytime. Alright. Frank McManus, November 20th, 2000, after WCG TV Studios in Brandon, Manitoba. Can you tell me your name and your rank and what your service numbers were in the morning? Mm -hmm. Well, my name is Frank McManus, and if you know the spelling, that's E-S on the end, not U-S. And where, where was I from? Your, uh, your rank oh. and your my rank when I ended up was a flight lieutenant, and my original number was R134835, and my officer's number was J21407. Where did you go? Just about 20 miles west of here in Alexander, Manitoba. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, how old were you when you enlisted? Oh, about 21, I think. Well, a little story to that, that uh, I didn't swim, I didn't like to walk. There was only one answer, it was go flying. <laughs> and that's, I stick to that because that's about what it was. And I'd never been in an airplane, but it sort of appealed to me and that's where I got to. Well, there used to be some. I was at an air show one time in Brandon here prior to 1939, and uh, uh, I guess I was interested in flying. And then they started to build the airports, and so in the beginning of the war, and I'd been involved in farming with my dad and, bro and brothers, and uh, uh, I thought I'd better do something about enlisting. My oldest brother, he was very interested in farming, and the younger one wasn't old enough to go, so I went. Let me, can I tell you right off the bat? <laughs> I think I can look it up right now. I enlisted on the 30th of the 10th month in 1941. Do you have friends enlisting in the Air Force at the time? There were three of us enlisted together. There was a cousin of mine by the name of Jimmy Kerr, who later flew Spitfires and ended up with the DFC. And, uh, another chap by the name of Jim Manson, and uh, I don't know where Jim ended up. There were three of us joined up at the same day. And Jim, I understood, you know, a number of years back, was living in Vancouver, and whether he fell off a roof doing shingling and carpenter work out there or something, but he didn't make it too many years after the war or something. So this is the way things go. We went to, on the train from Brandon to, or from Brandon to Winnipeg and enlisted in there, yeah. And but we got separated right afterwards. We never got to the same place after that. It was just, yeah, we got to Manning to put together, and after that we just sort of went our own ways. Tell me about Manning Depot. This was in Brandon. Mm -hmm. Well, Manning Depot, we uh, arrived here on the 30th of the 12th <laughs> in 1941 which was all right, and uh, they immediately sent us back home. But we didn't have far to go. So they sent us back home, and uh, we went out to Alexander, and then we had to come back in on, the, I think, the 1st or 2nd of January, and that's when we started our training at Manning Depot. And, of course, then you got into all the needles and all this type of stuff, inoculations. Didn't bother me, but uh, the ones that fainted were the great big husky guys. That sounds funny, but that's what happened. And from there, we, uh, as I said earlier, we uh, we didn't stay in the old arena, which was really number two Manning Depot. We got shipped up to the exhibition grounds, and it was all right. It was warm and everything else, except the weather was cold. It was cold, and we used to do route marches and stuff like this, and. Uh, we enjoyed it, I mean, we were just getting used to marching and so on, but I still don't like walking particularly. But uh, after that, we, uh, as I said, I quit eating breakfast at that time. 
used to go down from this um, automobile bedding down to the, where the cafeteria was as a lunch room and it was a cool day in January and uh, got up at six o'clock and get showered and down and pretty near froze to death. I thought if I got to have breakfast down here I quit eating and I very seldom even eat breakfast to this day. I don't think it really bothered. I mean, uh, you're talking now individual, everybody getting up and naked and going to the shower and stuff, I guess. It was something that just seemed to, you fit into it, that was all there was to it. It didn't bother me. I imagine, I think some people it may be bothered, but it didn't bother me. Something you got used to after a while. And the discipline? Pardon? The discipline, did you get used to that too? Oh, yes, yeah. Never got into too much trouble, but, uh, didn't want to. I got into this with into the service with the idea I was going to do the best I could, and so you know, some of the senior officers that gave the orders and so on, well, you didn't like them, but you had to put up with them. That was the whole name of the game, I guess. So how long were you there? Well, we left there. I went to Number One Repair Depot at St. John's, Quebec, which was just north of Quebec, to do what they called guard duty. And we left here on the, I got down there on the 16th of February in 42. So a month and a half almost. Yeah. And then I was there until the uh, hmm, 16th of the third month. I was there a month at 42. And that was just uh, doing guard duty outside, watching the buildings and so on, day and night. And uh, while we were there, uh, one time we had a great big snowstorm that stopped everything. About three feet of snow came in it. And this was just about 30 miles south of Montreal. And it was a great spot to be. And we got to Montreal a few times. Got to know a little bit of Montreal over there. The climate must have been uh, a little better, a little warmer, I think. A little warmer down here, yeah. yeah. But sometimes Manitoba wasn't too bad either, you know. Yeah, we went to initial training school at Victoriaville, Quebec, and we lived in what they called the Sacred Heart College. And uh, I was there from the 17th to the third month to the 9th to the fifth month. Mm -hmm. And what did, they, uh, what did they make you do there? Well, the there you were back on a certain amount of... Uh, marching and stuff like this and uh, all the uh, academic things started there i'm talking now about uh, aircraft aircraft recognition was a big one at that point in case you could overseas be able to know what airplanes were around what did and they do in that course Frank? What, would they flash yeah the i just flash things on the screen you're supposed to name them quickly just pictures of the aircraft and you got so you recognize them pretty good and uh, that was of all there was to that, but you end up with uh, weather weather recognition and navigation and all the stuff that pertained to flying, and except nothing to do with the particular airplanes at that point. There was nothing to do with the mechanical part of the airplanes, I mean, and it was just uh, a lot of uh, uh, more route marches and a physical training and stuff like this there, so this was a hard part to the time. But it was enjoyable, and you got to know all the guys. And I know we lived on the top floor. This was four floors, and every time you went up and downstairs, there was no no elevators. You ran up these stairs and down the stairs, and so on. I was in pretty good shape in those. I wouldn't do it today. <laughs> yes. What mm -hmm. was the food like there? Better? It was fairly good there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I still didn't get up for breakfast. It just didn't appeal to me anymore. So, and from there. And we went to, uh, I think we only left there once, and we went to, uh, hmm, I forget what the name of the uh, city was from there. And one of the bigger cities in southern Quebec, and uh, stayed there for a weekend. Or something. That was the only time we were away from there. Oh, you know, just look around, find the pub, and stuff like this, you know. Any yeah. dances? Pardon? Any dances? Not particularly, but... Uh, you weren't there long enough to really get involved in that. And uh, one thing that 
I had Victoria Villa that we didn't like, but I won't talk about it. <laughs> I might get criticized for it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from Victoriaville to uh, an EFTS school? Yep, at Chatham, New Brunswick, which was on the Miramichi River. And that's where we started onto our flying game. Remember your first time up in the plane? Well, I don't know that I remember the first time up, but I remember the well, the last time I was up before I went solo. And a fellow named Miss Smith was my instructor and uh, I don't know if you know much about flying it up, but they take you up and you do aerobatics and you do forced landings and practice takeoffs and landings and you're going all the time city and you're taking your ground school and writing exams and so on. They kept you busy. And I was at EFTS from uh, the 11th of June until the 29th of July. That's what it is. Six, seven, yeah. And in that length of time, I got, uh, I don't know how many hours I got at that point. Yeah, let's, yeah. And I, you know, what else I'm curious, do you remember how many um, hours with an instructor before you went solo? Yeah. You want that? Yeah, I, I think that's very interesting. To me, it never sounds like enough hours. <laughs> well, I commenced flying there, as I said, on June the 11th. I commenced flying. And I made my first solo at uh, at 9.05, nine hours and five minutes, I made my first solo trip. And that was a 15 minute trip. But before I went solo, I was going to tell you that uh, we'd done all the air work and so on, and this Mr. Smith said, now we'll show you a practice force landing. And so we'd done it before, and down this fleet finch we were flying at that time which was a biplane much the same as a tiger moth. And we ended up coming down over this field. And he said, now we're into the field. We'll pull up and go around again. So now I don't know whether I opened the throttle to go around again or he did. I forget what. But anyway, the engine spluttered and coughed and quit. And we landed in this field. And being at the time of the year it was, the hay in the field was about two feet high. It just grabbed the wheels of that fleet finch and just stopped the wheels. And we went upside down just like that. And I can remember the dead silence. <laughs> and Smith said, are you all right? And I said, yeah, yeah, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> and those were his words. And we dropped on our, on the heart, dropped out underneath the airplane and crawled out. And then there was people coming from all over at that time. But nobody got hurt. And, and then, was the plane relatively OK? Or? I never looked at it after. Well, I don't think it hurt it very much. It went over so slowly. And they'd pick it up and take it back and fix it up. But, uh, we, uh, and then I went back, and it wasn't very long till uh, it was the same day, I think, yeah. The 29th, yeah, same day. And I went back to the airport and got another airplane, and up and made a few circuits and sent me solo. Back in the saddle, hey? They probably wanted you to get up there again right away. And that taught me a lesson, too, because later on I had the same thing happen with a student that made a bad landing and so on before he went solo on the Harvard. And, uh, I done the same thing. I made him get out and get in another airplane. Like we damaged the airplane, and I took it in. I said, "Get in that other airplane." Took it. Made three more circuits with him. Sent him solo. He was an Australian guy, but he wouldn't have maybe went solo if I hadn't sent him right back up, or taken him right back up, I should say. Do you remember how you felt when you went back up in the air? No, because it all happened so fast. I don't think it was just one of the, I think it's just one of those things, and uh, went up, and that was it. And you asked how many hours I had when I finished flying at uh, elementary. Where are we? And would it all have been on finches? Yeah. That's the only thing they had at this school was the uh, fleet finch. And it was 65 hours and 55 minutes when I left there. That was the total time at elementary school. What and other types of classes were you taking? Well, again, it was uh, your sign navigation, and again, more aircraft recognition, uh, meteorology, uh, weather, and uh, all the things pertaining to navigation. And this was the big thing: was being able to navigate around the country and so on. Yeah. Um, any men from other countries to add to that EFTS school with you? No, 
I don't recall anybody at the EFTS from other countries. No, I don't. And the instructors, were there civilian instructors? Some of them, yeah, they were in civilian instructors at that time. There was Mr. McMillan here, and who else was there? I forget who now. Yeah, that's uh, about it. Oh yes, and one one thing too I might mention to you, during the time I was in the Air Force, I forget how many trips I made back and forth across Canada by train. That was a lot of like Every time you finish course, like when I finished it uh, at St. John's, Quebec, I was home that time before we went to Victoriaville. And then when we went to uh, down to uh, Chatham here from Victoriaville, we were back home again. And then from the finish at, uh, at uh, Chatham, uh, before we went to service flying, we came back home again. That's a long train ride from down there. Yes. How much time would you have? Uh, well, you might have a week or something. And maybe just, it just sometimes took us two days to come home and two days to go back and you know, three or four days at home. But well, that was the way everybody was doing it, and it was interesting. I think all told during the war I spent 30 days and nights on trains and I've been on a train once since the war was over. Quite a change. Yeah. What do you do on the train all day? Just sit and that's about all. Read. Yeah. And sleep. Sometimes you had to come through you didn't get a berth. I mean you just sat up all the time. And you got fed on the train. Yeah, you always met up with different people who run the train, you know. And the Air Force done a lot, a lot of flying, I think, or a lot of train traveling between stations. I think maybe even more than the Army and the Navy did, but because uh, you got time off between, you'd head for home and back again. Tell me about SFTS school. Okay, SFTS was at. Uh, Aylmer, Ontario. No, pardon me. Uh, Moncton, New Brunswick. That's uh, now service of Moncton. So I didn't move very far from Chatham to Moncton. It's only a little ways down south. Once you were out east, you stayed out east. You know? hmm? Once you were out east, you stayed That's right, yeah. Well, I think there seemed to be something in the military that if you were from eastern Canada, you they got sent west to do their training. If you were from the west, you got sent east. They figured it would stop people from uh, going flying around their own hometowns and stuff like this, you know. Whether it did or not, I don't know. But you Maybe harden you up, get you away from home. Uh, it could be, yeah. But we had a good time no matter where. But all the time I was at Moncton, New Brunswick. I think I was in Moncton three times. That's it. Yeah. So you may see. Yeah. Busy well, you had time off. But uh, down in New Brunswick at that time, there was a. There was no uh, no bars, no liquor concession or anything else. The only place there was liquor was on the basis, which I guess we get into the habit of having a drink down again. But it was interesting, I'll tell you the truth. What about, uh, while we're on the subject of recreation, were there sports teams, things like that, at the school? Well, they had some people played sports and so on. I wasn't much into sports and so on. I, I guess I was one of the guys that wanted to do as good as I could. and. Kept on going, yeah. So what kind of planes were you on there? All Harvards. Harvards. Yeah. How did you find the Harvard in comparison to the Fleet Finch? Well, the Fleet Finch was a, an aircraft that had a narrow undercarriage, and it was fairly tricky to keep straight on takeoff and landings. And the Harvard, of course, we were into one with a retractable undercarriage and stuff. But as far as taking off and landing, it, it was just an airplane that took off and landed. But later on, when we, uh, maybe I'll leave it till later, but when we were uh, teaching flying uh, at Aylmer, Ontario, we were getting quite a few people that were coming off the Cornell airplane, which was a later one that was at the elementary schools. And we had a heck of a time getting those boys flying on the Harvards because they had a big white undercarriage like the Cornell, 
and you headed for the airfield and trimmed the tail heavy and closed the throttle and went down and land itself pretty well. Where the fleet finch didn't do that or neither neither did a tiger moth. But the Harvard was one that was you had to work at it to keep it straight. And so when they come in and started to fly the Harvard after this Cornell, it was a different story getting them sold than it was the ones that came off the Tiger Moss and so on. So what else would you like to know about the service now? Oh, were there any scary moments at Brunson? Oh, Up in the air? not particularly. There were people that were that done foolish things and got themselves in trouble and got killed. There was a few of them. Like there was a mid-air collision or something down there one time. Weren't watching it close enough to what they were doing. And then you saw the pictures that I took when I was flying down there. And they didn't like you taking two pictures of the military bases, you know. You weren't supposed to do this. But, oh, we managed to get a few of them. And was your mail censored at all in any way? What went out was supposed to be censored, yes. You didn't seal the envelopes when you put them in. And they were checked on pretty closely. More so from, from when I have to go over the old country, it was more so from there than it was in Canada. But there was a certain amount of censorship done on your mail. How was the morale of the men, you know, with, with the accidents happening and training and stories from overseas? I don't think it ever bothered anybody. You were, you were doing a job. And uh, I know it didn't affect me or the other guys I was with, I don't think. And you had enough time off to uh, do things. But the only, I was going to say, the only time I went to Moncton, one of the only times I went to Moncton, was to see Bing Crosby and White Christmas. <laughs> that was the only, and the only movie I think I saw in Moncton. Were you there over Christmas then? Pardon? Were you there over Christmas? No, no. No, we went there on the seventeenth, uh, seventeenth of the eighth month. That's what August. August, yes. And we left there on the fourth of uh, December. Okay. So I went. I wasn't home to any time during that period of time. Yes, I remember. Yeah, and it was. Uh, I was all set to go overseas and so on. I think I'm going to get overseas and get into this war. And I didn't uh, have any idea what was going to happen. And, but anyway, I I studied as good as I could and I wrote my exams and so on. I got a, a good average mark, I guess, on the flying. And but anyway, when I graduated. I, presented me with pilot officer's wings. A lot of them were still graduating as sergeants, but I managed to get PO's wings. And I figured, well, I'm all set to go overseas and help fight this war. And uh, it ended up that I got sent to uh, flying instructor school at uh, Trenton to become an instructor. And at the time I finished service flying training school, and we done everything. We done aerobatics and so on. But when we left there, I had, I'll give you a total here in a minute. I think it's in here. Remember how you felt when they told you? That I was going instructing? Yeah. It didn't appeal to me. I wasn't too fussy about it. Were there several of you that were asked to become Oh, there was always quite a bunch. Uh, that, that funny, uh, in that book, uh, uh, Typhoon and Tempest, on this uh, Hugh Halliday that uh, looked up everything, and I asked him, I, didn't, I said, I don't know how come I ever became an instructor. He said, I know how it got, you got to be an instructor. I said, how? He said, you had some of the highest marks in ground school and so on, and this is why they picked the, the better ones to go instructing. I said, well, if I'd known that, I'd have stopped that. But I didn't know that until that book was going to be here a few, years back, a few years back. So and he went to the archives in Ottawa and found this information out. And if you wonder how many hours I had when I finished uh, 
service. It was 293 hours and 45 minutes. So that was the total time I had when I went to an instructor school. Uh, so did you go undergo some training to become an instructor at Pardon? ALM? Did you take training to become an instructor at ALM when you got there? Uh, no, we okay. just... They put you right to work instructor? Yeah, after we finished uh, flying instructor school, yeah. You didn't go to school? Mm-hmm. Do you remember for how long? Right. Well, flying instructor school, I went there on... The 28th of the 12th month mm. in 1942. Right after yeah, and then we left there again on the 17th of February. So that's how long we were there. What kind of uh, courses did you take? Do you remember what they? Uh, well, it was mostly flying and showing maneuvers and doing this type of stuff. And it was a, a great experience. And I'm not sorry that I went through there in the first place because I think maybe by going through it and becoming a flight instructor, it maybe saved my life in the long run after I got overseas because you were a little more capable of knowing what to do with an airplane. And you'd run into mistakes students had made with you and you had to correct that. And so it helped a lot. And uh, the big thing that it says in here is patter test. Now you may wonder what that is. Well, patter test was what you would say and how you explain things to a student. Maybe before you got them in the air, and also while you were in the air, talking to them. And this pattern meant how you talk to students. And that's what, there was quite a bit of that done. What kind of planes were you instructing on? At there? At Aylmer. Oh, at, on Harvard's. It was on All Harvard, yeah. Harvard's. And at the uh, instructor's school, I think we said. We had a few Cornells. As I see here, we flew Cornells for a while at the instructor school. So we got a little variety of airplanes as we went along, which was nice. Well, that's an added experience, too, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we left there. I had my category test. That's what they classified it was your final flight test and a category test. And you wrote exams and so on, you went on. And at the Central Flying School of Trenton here, it says that a C average single engine, and the date was the uh, second of the ninth month in 1943. Should become a capable instructor with experience, it says. So what else could they say? And that was it for Trenton. Then we got to Aylmer. Yeah, again, you want to know that, do you? on the 18th of the second month of 43. Yeah. And I was there until the 18th of the first month in 44. So I was there about 11 months. Do you remember the day you found out you were going to be going overseas? Uh, well, yes and no. I don't tell you the exact day, but... No, I, I don't mean no. the date. I felt, well, I wanted to get going over there. I figured I'd done enough instructing about a year of it. And when I got to uh, Aylmer, I had 315 hours and 10 minutes. I, made, I should have made a correction back there because when I was at, uh, when I first went to flying instructor school, I had 237 hours. I said it was in a southern figure, but it wasn't, okay? And we started at Aylmer, as I say, on the first flight was there on February the 21st. Between each of these schools, we, we managed to get that train ride back home and back again. We were home at Christmas time, and uh, like before I went to flying instructor school, we reported there just before New Year's, but we'd been home for Christmas and back, and then we got down there and said, oh, well, you shouldn't have been here for two days. We're not going to start until the first of the year. So we sat around there for a couple of days and done nothing after we got to flying instructor school. And then once you knew you were going overseas, were you home again? Did yep. You were? Mm -hmm. you were. And we were home a couple of times while we were at Aylmer, too, which was very nice. Yeah, of course. And 
I don't know how many students, but these names in here. There's one fellow, um, um, L.A. Wilson, L.A.C. Wilson in here. And that was fine. I taught him to fly, I guess, and so on. And uh, and one day after after the war was all over, and I was back doing uh, flying training at the Brandon Flying Club. This fellow walks in with his logbook, and uh, he says, "I'd like to learn to fly all over again." I said, "I was in the Air Force and so on." So give me his logbook, the logbook up, and there was my name as his, as his instructor. So the name Art Wilson from Minnesota. And so, I think Art still, no, I think Art died a couple of years ago for a minute or so, but him and I were pretty good friends. So, um, let's talk about going overseas. Mm -hmm. Remember the boat trip was like? What boat were you on? Went over on the Ile de France. And when we left Aylmer, we went to, uh, Uh, where did we go? Yeah, we left Aylmer. Of course, we were home on leave before we went. And then we went down to... Uh, I have to look this up now. Well, we were waiting to go... Some people used to go direct to Halifax and go on the boats to overseas. By the time this was coming along, I'm talking now in 43, that we went from Aylmer, went 44 actually, they sent us to Lachine, Quebec, which is just outside of Montreal, for a waiting period of there, and we arrived there on the uh, first of the second month, first of February. And we were there, and we didn't leave, and we were there two weeks. We left there on the 13th to go to Halifax and to get on the boat. And then we got on the boat, the Ile de France, on the 16th of the second, and we arrived over in uh, England on the 24th of the second month, at 44. How did you on the boat? No, we were up in, uh, the officers and so on were up on, I think, B or C deck or something like this, and uh, of course you were packed in like sardines. There was over 5,000 troops on that airplane, or on that boat. And there was a friend, a friend of mine in the Army was on the boat. He was down in about uh, F deck or something. And one day he asked me to go down and see him. I went down, and the smell and the stench down there, I said, after this, you want to see him, you come up to my place, <laughs> which he did. But down in the lower decks, it must have been dynamite to live down there because they had hammocks hung up on the sun. But we had uh, stacks of cots, like the three cots, there were single cots, but there were three deep, if I recall correctly. But they were packed in. You just had room to walk between them in these state rooms. And you got two meals a day, which was all there was. And one little episode you might want to be interested in. There was a lot of Americans on board this, uh, American Army guys going overseas. And I remember their, the first meal we were sitting down to, uh, these Americans said, oh, there won't be many Canadians at the table after we get out in the open waters. Yeah, that's fine. So nobody paid much attention to it. And I think the first day out, there was one American that was missing for a meal. We got two meals, morning and night. And the second day, there was a couple more of them. And there was one day, this table, the tables were end to end, like, and of course, I don't know how many was in the whole thing, but these are just two tables we were interested in. And these Americans, there was one guy who showed up for a meal, the rest were all sick. But there wasn't a Canadian that missed a meal at our table. And did that poor guy get H? <laughs> it's just a little comedy thing, but. Do you take evasive maneuvers at all? Right oh, they did, I think, a couple of times. But uh, once they got out of harbor, like the old Ile de France was a pretty fast boat, and the subs just didn't catch them. I mean, they were fast enough that they didn't catch them. Granted, the seas were pretty rough a couple of times and so on, but I see. I, I may, maybe feel a little queasy, but I never missed a meal or anything like that. and. Uh, some days were real bad, you'd maybe sit close to your bunk and lay down. But you, you had nothing else to do because there was no, there was no sports on there because there was no room. It was just, everybody was crowded together. What were you able to take over with you? What you just your uniforms, that was all. That's it. Yeah. Nothing personal? No. Well, whatever you want personally, but I mean, uh, some pictures, but that's about all you could take with you. 
but we had a good, uh, it was a good trip over. And I remember when we went into, we saw airplanes, like the Allied airplanes, the day before we went into to land, and or to dock, I should use the correct word, I guess. And uh, we knew we were getting close to land then, but we never saw a thing. We didn't see land or anything else. The next morning, that we went to bed. The next morning, we were at, at dock in Greenock in Scotland, right up between Ireland and England, and up into Scotland. And then from there, we uh, went from there to where? No, the Ile de France, then we went straight down to Bournemouth, which is on the south coast of England, which was a holding unit. It's a, a summer resort is what it is down there, a great big place summer resort. And we were there from the uh, 25th of the 2nd until the 18th of the 4th before we got to uh, a unit to take more further training over there. And then when we did get further training, why? But in the meantime, while we were at Bournemouth, we took some time off, caught the trains, went to London and stuff like this. And what did you think of England? Different. Have you ever been there? No. It's, well, I don't know what it's like now. We were back about, uh, this Jim Wood and myself that were on the same squadron together. We were back, what is it, about seven or eight years ago, I guess, we took a some of the some of the New Zealand and Australian boys that had been with us on the squadron overseas were coming back to England for a reunion, and Jim and I flew back over. We we're only away a week, but there were 13 of us sat down to dinner at the Royal Air Force Club in London when we were back over there at this trip, and uh, it was London itself was cleaned up an awful lot uh, to what it was during the war. But other than that, I. So after that, we went from there, and uh, I don't know how many times we went to London, but it was a few times. And I went out and visited a, a farm one time from the people, the farm people would come in and take anybody they wanted to go to visit their farm for a weekend or something. And uh, there was two of us went out to this farm, and I was surprised how big the farms were over there. They were, they were farming a thousand acres, which was a bigger farm than they ever farmed in Canada, basically, at that time. And they had heard of dairy cattle and a herd of beef cattle and everything. This guy was a big farmer. Now, they weren't all that big, but I, I was always under the impression that they were just little pasture-like farms. But I was surprised to see a farm that size over there. That was back in 44. Were there any bigger now or what? I don't know. But anyway, after that, we went from there to number seven advanced flying unit at Peterborough, England, which is just north and a bit east of uh, London. And we were there from the 18th of the fourth month until the uh, 26th of the sixth month. Training. Yeah. What kind of training? Well, there we flew the, uh, uh, started flying on the Miles Master in England, which was much the same as the Harvard to a point in this country. It's got, it's always different, but uh, about the same size airplane and flew like that. And we also uh, got checked out on the hurricane at this uh, uh, at this unit, the EFU Advanced Flying Unit. And a little story about the hurricanes. There was Jim Wood, my friend, and myself, and another uh, name of Church, three Canadians at this Eshot, or at this Peterborough. And there was a big race on, horse race. I forget where it was now. It wasn't too far away from this school we were at. So we thought, well, we'll go and watch the horse race. So we managed to get a hold of the three hur hurricanes, the three Canadians got the three hurricanes, and we went to see the horse race. And the horse race was it was about a mile long, but they started not like an oval track. What they done down there, they started at one end and come down in a curve and straight down towards the finish. And it would be a mile race, but that would be a half a mile across and um, in front of the grandstand. This is fine. And as 
we were circling around with that and we started looking around. Airplanes, I never seen so many airplanes in my soul at watching a horse race. There was everything from tiger moss to the hurricanes to flying fortresses to Lancaster, everything circling this race. And the American fighter airplanes, and it still stands out in my mind, even to this day, that as the horses were going across the finish line, some American in a Mustang, which is a fighter aircraft, the Americans, went straight over the horses' heads right in front of the grandstand. Just one pass, just as they were going over the center line. Nobody would ever get his number or anything else. He was going so fast, he was down and gone. But on the, the news that night of the race on, uh, over the radio and so on, you could hear this airplane go by as the horses were <laughs> going by the finish line. So those are things that stick out in your mind. I don't say I don't take it. I don't know whether it made a difference to the end of the race or not. But well, but he went right on over it, and that was quite a little episode just to go and do that. Yeah. Yeah. And from there, you know, maybe you want to know where we went from there. So after Peterborough, and uh, we'd done quite a bit of uh, flying there. I don't know how much there was. It doesn't matter. Not a lot. Maybe. 40 hours, if, if that. And from there, we, they sent us up to uh, number 57 OTU, which is Operational Training Unit, at Eshot, up in northern England, up near the Scottish border. And we had a good time up there. We were there from the 27th of June until the 9th of, uh, no, from the, until the 13th of the ninth month, which was okay. And we trained on Spitfires up there. We had uh, we flew Mark II and Mark V Spitfires in training. And you learned operational flying, and of course you, you still had aircraft recognition, all this stuff at ground school, and map reading, which was very, very necessary if you're going to be wandering around the country, you want to have to read a map. And you fired guns. They had drogues they pulled, and you would go to the airplanes and shoot at these drogues towed behind the other airplanes and so on. So altogether it was an interesting being. And after we were through there, and uh, I don't know how many hours we had there, it really doesn't matter. We didn't get a lot. And then we had a chance then to pick what airplanes we wanted to go on for going on operations. and. This is about the time that uh, we didn't, uh, we liked the Spitfire, a nice airplane to fly, but for some reason the Typhoon that we're talking about seemed to satisfy us, and Jim and I, and I forget how many others, so we'd like to take a crack at the Typhoons. And they were a bigger airplane. Have you any idea what they weighed? They weighed seven tons on takeoff. That's 14,000 pounds. And they had a big engine in them, a 24-cylinder engine in them, an inline engine, and there were four banks of six. There was two banks of uh, cylinders up this way and then two down below like this. And there was a Napier Sabre engine, which was an engine that you didn't baby. You pounded the devil out of it because you started to ease up on it and so on. And it was okay while you were flying, and, but when you come back down and ease all the way back down and so on, the possibility of the plugs falling up on the next takeoff were true, and I'll talk to you about that one later on. Uh, and how, just you up in, a, in that time? Only one seat in them. Only There's only one seat in a Hurricane and a Spitfire and Typhoon. And uh, well, I took a Spitfire to 30-some thousand feet when we were up at uh, Ashot just to, for a height climb and see how it performed. And from up there you could see Ireland and so on from a nice clear day I was up there. And you could see the coast of Ireland and so on. So that's the only, that's as close as I ever got to Ireland. And it was interesting. So from there, we decided that uh, we would like to go to uh, the Typhoons. So they sent us from there to uh, Tactical Exercise Unit at Aston Downs, which was down the south and west part of England. And we took a number of hours there. We weren't there very long. We were there from the 16th of the 9th to the 5th of the 10th at Aston Downs. So that was our training on the on the uh, typhoon. 
That's what I done on the Typhoon, and I don't know if everybody or not. They said that uh, it's a tricky airplane to fly, and it was to a point. But as I said, with my previous experience, I think it done me good doing this instructing. Because an airplane is an airplane. But the Typhoon had a very small fin and rudder on it. And if you open the throttle too fast on takeoff, before you got enough speed up for the fin and rudder to take effect with the airflow, if you open the throttle too fast, it would just turn to the right on you. So, but you kept trying until you made as fast as you could get once, and it made that move. After that, you knew what it would do. So anyway, when I got the airplane, they told me what it would do, and I said, well, I'm not going to play with this airplane on the ground. I took it up to about 17,000 feet and played around with unstalled spins, loops, rolls, everything with this airplane. That's how I would teaching on Harvard's and so on, until I knew what that airplane felt like. Then I went back down and done my circuits with it for training. And I thought this was the way to go. Now, not everybody thought the same as I did. So would you say, Frank, of all the planes, the Typhoon was the one you enjoyed the most in terms of just flying? Yeah, it was, uh, as far as an operational flying aircraft was concerned, it was real good, I think. And of course, the later model Spitfires, I said, well, I flew the two to fives. Well, they were up to Mark 22 and 23 when they finished, and they were faster than the Typhoon as they went up in different models. But they done more air to air, where the Typhoon, we were more or less uh, air to ground attacking with the Typhoons on, in operations. And we used to get. Uh, We'd fly patrol between the front lines. I'm talking the Germans on the Allied front lines, you know, in the northern part of uh, Holland and so on. That's where we joined. We weren't there at D-Day. I was any chance it was way after D-Day when we got there. And we'd fly along in radio contact with people on the ground. And w sometimes we would go and look for something to attack, but so sometimes, too, we'd be sent out on this patrol. And the Army would call up and say, There'd be a red smoke target at such and such a position from where you are in so many minutes. And so they, the artillery would lob a red smoke trajectory in there, and you went down and attacked wherever that smoke hit. And it could be a tank that they couldn't dislodge, or it could be snipers in trees. It could be anything that uh, they couldn't get at and dislodge themselves, so we we go down and do it for them. And we got a lot of praise afterwards, at, like the typhoons, and not myself, but the typhoons themselves doing a good job on this type of stuff. And there was one day we went down and uh, one train went after. We used to go out train busting and stuff like this, you know. And we saw this train, and they could shut the smoke off just like right now, but we caught the smoke because on top of the trains, they used to paint rails and ties across the top of the cars. So if the train was stopped, unless you were down low enough to get a side view of it, you'd just think it was a train, uh, just a railroad track. But we caught this one, and uh, so there was four of us went down, and we started taking it across this little valley it was in. And we got the train, the engine, and a bunch of cars off the track, and so on, got a fire started. And uh, then we said, no, see, the guy was uh, leading us, four of us, he said, let's take it end to end. So we went around and come down into this valley, just started end to end, and this anti aircraft guns were sitting on top of the hill, waiting, us, waiting for us, us to do this. and. Uh, so we were printing out of ammunition by this time, so as soon as the firing started, we just pulled them sky high and went straight up. And as you were going up, you sort of done a roll going up, so they didn't know where you were going to come out. And only one got a few bullet holes in it out of the four of us, so we got away with that pretty lucky. <laughs> well, there was little tricks to all this stuff, you know. We should mention what squadron you were in. I was in 175 Squadron, which was an RAF squadron. and. We liked the RAS squadron in this respect, that a Canadian squadron, there was, some of the boys said there was a lot of red tape to it, you know, you all Canadians, you had to do exactly as you're told and so on. But we had, we had South Africans and we had Australians and New Zealanders and some Polish fellows, we had everybody, all types of people on this squadron. And everybody had along real good together, there was no doubt about it. it was a, we liked it being there. Well, there was about, uh, I guess there was about 10 Canadians in it, and uh, one chap went out one day and didn't come back, uh, Parker, and, and there's different people that uh, we learned to fly, or we were flying with and on operations. 
And there was one day we were out on an operation at, uh, at towards the end of the war. And I still think that I could have saved the guy's life if I'd have been a few seconds quicker than I was. In fact, I didn't do it at all. We were mar attacked in the marshalling yards in, in the Ruhr Valley in Germany. And this guy was, uh, I think he was, well, the leader went down, he was number two, and I was number three down or something, and there was some following me. And I saw this guy going down with the airplane, and I thought, God, he's getting close to the ground. I was just going to grab the mic button and holler, pull out, and he hit the ground. Well, you can imagine what would happen, an airplane of that weight going down. You can reverse the airplane into a climbing attitude, but the momentum still takes it down before it goes up. This is what happened to him. He went too low, and when he pulled out, it just kept on going. There was just a flash of flame in the middle of the marshalling yards, and that was the end of him. But I still think if I had grabbed the mic and hollered at him 10 or 15 seconds ahead of that, I could have saved his life. But you never know. Yeah. Uh, when you were at radio contact with another plane, could everyone else hear you, or was it only contact with that one plane? Oh, it was supposed to be that. Anyone's on the squadron could maybe hear it, yeah. Other squadrons had their own frequencies and so on, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was interesting. Yeah, makes you wonder. Mm -hmm. Well, can I backtrack? Yes, absolutely. This was when I was at Trenton, Ontario, uh -huh. and we were <coughs> flying Harvards there, and we were doing night flying. And this one night, uh, it was in January, of course, and we flew from 6 o'clock at night till 6 in the morning doing night flying with all the people that were going through flying instructors. And at Trenton, they didn't plow the snow off the field. They had great big rollers and cat tractors, pulling them with uh, blades behind it, level it down. And this is the way they kept the whole field. These tractors and that ran night and day to keep the snow packed. But at night when you started to fly, they would put two sets of electric lights out uh, side by side to designate a runway on that snow. And of course, when you're taking off and landing, you're landing between the second and the third light. That was where you would try and land. And by midnight, the runway, that particular hunk of runway landing harbor's on them was pretty well chewed up, full of holes, so you had to be careful. But this one night, I'm on the second shift between midnight and morning, and I managed to dig a wing into the ground on the harbor due to this rough snow and so on. So the next morning, I'm up on the carpet, and I said, well, I'm not going to get myself in trouble for this, so they were going to say you're going to do this, and I said, wait a minute. And I said, I've got a suggestion to make. And I said, what would that be? And I said, well, at midnight, why not take this slate and move it over here and make a new runway? Oh, that's a good idea. I never get into trouble to talk my way out of that one. <laughs> but that's what they've done from then on. And I think it saved a lot of people getting into trouble. So I hope I've done some good. Oh. Now, where were we? Well, this tie, I've got, I suppose, is on, t on film, is it? But this tie was a fellow named Jack Frost was on the squadron with us. I was an Englishman. And he was one of our flight commanders, but an awful good guy. And he was over touring in the States. I'm going back now. I guess about four years ago. And he contacted Jim and myself, Jim Wood and myself. And... Uh, said he wasn't going to stop in Manitoba, but he was going to be in Alberta. And he wondered if we could maybe contact him. I said, well, I've got a son out there, in fact, three sons. And I said, no problem. And so we got a hold of Jim, and we drove out to Alberta, and we met Jack. We had a good time with him, and uh, met all my kids in different places. And uh, anyway, when we were at my son's house with us one night, and he was and he brought these ties out. And he said, this is what I wanted to present to you guys if I could see you in this country. And he 
said, and you told, give us the tie, and he said, now these ties, it was commissioned by the powers that be in Britain that these particular ties could only be worn by people who had done operational flying on the Hawker Typhoon. So that's why I've got this tie. I cherish that tie pretty much right now. Well, after the after the war was over, on what was it, at, uh, 6th of June or something, or whatever, I forget. Oh, in May it was over over there, and we were at uh, where were we? Well, all told over there, if you want to know where we were, we were at uh, after we got fr uh, went to Aston Down, then we went to Thorny Island, where we finished our training on the typhoons over there. And I got to 175 Squadron on the 14th of the 10th month, so the 14th of November. November? No. Uh, October. October, yeah. And I was only there for a, a short period of time, and I managed to uh, get clobbered by anti personnel bombs. I'd only made one trip on operations. And we'll come back, and we'd been living there, but we were living in an old schoolhouse about, this is at Vokel in Holland. And we were living in this old schoolhouse. And we were, I'd done the trip for the day, and I think we'd done a recreation or another flight besides that, but only one operational flight. So we were back about four in the afternoon. We were back at the barracks. We were through for the day. Other people were doing the flying. and. Uh, this guy hollered out, Mac, it's your turn to light the fire for tea. That was my nickname, Mac. So I went rushing out to light the stove, it was outside, and so I get in the wood around and so on, all of a sudden I heard these pop, 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 and I, I threw myself flat on the ground, my head up against the building of the school, the wall of the school. <coughs> and all of a sudden I felt something in my foot, a piece of shrapnel had gone into the bottom of my left foot. And so that put me out of commission for some time. And actually, I can tell you how it was. That was on the 11th of the 4th, uh, what was it? Oh, it doesn't matter, but that was the 10th, anyway, over there. And anyway, on the 